right, good to see everybody here this evening. Take a songbook. Let's start by singing together, shall we? Turn over, if you will, 490. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died. Revive us again. Let's stand together to sing it. Number 490, Brother Bob will lead us. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died. singing and uh, that's what we come for in the middle of the week isn't it just a good shot in the arm and uh, give you a, a little more strength a little more energy and uh, we're excited about tonight uh, good to have the Kiefer's with us this evening and uh, 37 years in Brazil as missionaries and uh, uh, this church has supported them from the beginning and uh, on off and on more on than off but uh, off and on over the years and uh, it's our first opportunity to meet them and uh, they've come through since we've been here and uh, delight to have them I'll say more about them in just a moment but uh, this is exciting don't you like it when the flags go up Amen. it just adds so much and uh, so much color and it's uh, it's good excited about uh, tonight excited about the next few days the Lord's gonna what the Lord's gonna do in our midst and uh, thanks for being here tonight appreciate it and uh, let's open with a word of prayer shall we father we bow before you this evening and Lord we Thank you for your goodness to us, and thank you for another opportunity for us to gather together here. Thank you for each one who's made their way to church this evening, Lord, and they pray that you'd bless them for the effort they've made, and some have had to rush home from work and uh, quickly maybe grab a bite to eat and then uh, make it into church. And I pray, Lord, you'd, you'd settle us down and uh, help us to focus on what you have for us here this evening. Lord, thank you for Bill and Susan Kiefer. Thank you for their faithfulness to you through the years. Thank you for what you've done through them in the land of Brazil. And, Lord, I pray that you would speak through him this evening, Lord, and use him to challenge our hearts to reach the world with the gospel. And so, Father, control our service this evening. Make it just exactly what you would want it to be. And we'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can be seated. And um, as I said, we have... Brother and Mrs. Kiefer, and uh, Brother Kiefer is going to uh, come. They are in their, they're, they're beginning their fourth church when they go back and uh, starting their fourth church. They have a camp. You'll, you'll see some of these things, and uh, they are uh, just, just done in some amazing things, and uh, they're looking for laborers. They, uh, they're like the Macedonian call, come over and help us. And uh, he'll say more about that tonight as well. Enjoyed hearing just about what God had done. Uh, with them uh, over the years and uh, it's just a blessing and an honor to have them here tonight I'm so glad that it worked out they could come and be with us and uh, Brother Kiefer you come if you would and uh, you guys can take the first part of the service here and do your first presentation all right amen good evening how many of you already know us? Yeah, it's good to have at least a half dozen. That's always good. Okay, that shows this church is growing. That's a blessing. A lot of churches in this country are shrinking. I was just so glad to talk to your pastor and find out you believe in winning souls and uh, believe in evangelization, and, and we're glad about that. We are the Keepers. We've been in Brazil for 37 years. What we're going to do tonight 
is not present the Kiefer ministry. We're going to present your ministry uh, down in Brazil. This is one of those churches that a young couple came. We were young ones. Uh, a young couple came here talking about a place they'd never been, doing a job they'd never done, and speaking a language they had never spoken. And by faith, you took them on for support anyway. I just appreciate that. And what you're going to be seeing tonight is just what God has done. It's not through our talent. It's what God has done through the gifts and prayers of people just like yourselves here. So we just appreciate being here tonight. I brought my wife up here because it's for a couple of reasons. Number one is to have something that looks a little better up here. <laughs> and also, I'll be giving more of my testimony later on. So I just like Susan to give her a greeting and a testimony, and then we'll go on. It is a blessing to be here. A verse that God has given me this furlough has been 2 Corinthians 1.11 says, Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. And we want to thank you for your prayers. And all these years that we've been in Brazil, the key to any souls that are saved, the key to any problem that we have is prayer. And we just encourage you, if you didn't get our prayer card already, get it, put it in your Bible, so when you read your Bible every day, I hope you read it every day, that you'll see us and you'll pray, because we believe, even though you may not know exactly what's needed right then, but God knows, and also if you want to know the recent prayer requests and, and different things that are going on, our email is on the card, if you'll just send us on that email, just send us your email, and we'll put you on our mailing list, and you can have up-to-date uh, prayer requests. Another verse that God, that, that's one of my favorite, is Philippians 1 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And all those years ago, when we first started out, didn't really know what, what to expect when we got to the field, that we, that was. That was my anchor, you know, that we can have confidence in the Lord. And I'll tell you, all these years later, that same confidence is there and that, that God has never failed us. And even through the difficulties we've had five years ago with Bill's heart surgery, I'm sure he'll bring that out a little bit, you know, a new experience in Brazil, and I had, <laughs> I had to have my son teach me how to use a bank card, and just simple things like that. But God brought us through. And it's just wonderful to be able to trust the Lord. And let me encourage you on your missions in Philippians 4.17. It says, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Every soul that's saved on the field, if you're praying for your missionary, if you're giving, that goes to your account too. So it isn't just for us, it's for you and to be able to experience the winning of souls. And I praise the Lord for the time, for the Opportunity he's given us to be able to be in Brazil. A little update on our children. They're not small anymore. Susanna Ruth is 35, and she married an American-born Brazilian. I don't, maybe a few of you will remember, our, both of our children are adopted Brazilians. Of course, they're Americans now, too. And, and so we call Susanna our Brazilian-born American, and she ha married an American-born Brazilian. And we just praise the Lord for that. We have three grandkids. The twins are seven, a boy and a girl. And we have Felipe, he's three. And they're, they're a joy. We're going to be able to see them in about a week and a half. And so be able to spend a little bit of time for them when we, until we go back to the field in November. And we just praise the Lord. Samuel's 30. He's not married. And he works at Mitsubishi Motors there in Catalan. And he does live, lives with us now. He lived in town for a while, and then he asked to come back, see if he could live at home, and that's fine. It drives the 20 miles, because we live out on the campground. That's been a blessing, too, to be there at the campground, and, and it's just beautiful what God has given us, and you'll see that on the slides. And we just want to encourage you, pray for us. We need it. You know, pray for us, and, and we just thank you for your support. Okay, if we can have the... Boy, they're uh, jolly on the spot, aren't they? You are our partners. And I don't mean that just lamely. You really are partners in this ministry. Yes, I turned it on. 
It's on green. And it's on. Okay. But they'll keep turning it down and down and down until it's almost off again. Um, I wanted to show you tonight the project needs that we do have down in Brazil. There are just three of them. But I'd like to show you, first of all, how we came to these needs. Number one, everything starts with God. There's nothing that starts outside of God. We as humans have needs. How many of you have needs here? We all have needs. Where do you go for your need? Well, you go to Obama, right? No, we go to God. And that's what a missionary does. A missionary asks God for provision. Okay, then what do we do? We need to communicate that need with our partners. And then what do we want you to do? Oh, you want to give money. Well, that would be helpful. But we want you to communicate with God. I want you to ask God what he wants you to do about the need that we have down on Brazil, in Brazil, okay? It's just as simple as that. I'm not asking anybody for anything except for you to go before God's throne and say, okay, God, what do you want us to do? Now, what do we need? God supplies. Now, what do we want him to supply? First of all, we want him to supply people. We need people, qualified people, that will come down and give their lives to serve God. I didn't say go down there for two or three years and then quit and come back. I said go down there and spend your lives. People ask me, well, Bill, uh, when are you going to retire? And I say, well, I followed the Elijah plan for retirement. They say, what's that? I said, when God's through with me, he'll take me home. Before then, I'm not retiring. Now, I might have to preach in a wheelchair, but that'd be all right as long as God's using us, and that's what we want. And I would encourage you to come down to Brazil and also be under that same type. The second need we have is an activity center. I told Pastor tonight, a few years ago, I purchased some cattle, registered cattle. They are Brahma, Brahma cattle. I brought a Brahma bull. I mean, he was, he was a lot of bull. He was big. He was big. And someone had convinced me that if I buy these cattle, they'll reproduce, and I'll be able to sell the offspring and make a lot of money to help camp. You know what you call that in Old English? Foolishness. And God put an exclamation point behind that. You know how? He sent one lightning strike. I know. He doesn't just send one. It's a lot of them that come. But all it took was one and killed 13 of the 15 cattle. Okay, I lost $9,000, but that's not the point. The point is, normally that weekend that we lost the cattle would have been a teen retreat, but I was preaching another teen retreat. Can you imagine that would have been 13 young people? I just kind of shiver inside on that. That's just is awful. We need the activity center. And to build this activity center, we're seeking to raise $82,000. I mean, here in this country, $82,000 is what you pay for a site plan uh, if you want to make a building. I don't know how much building we'll be able to do. We'll at least be able to get up the covering and cement and maybe even wall it in. I don't know. But pray with us about God, what God would have you to do. And then support. We're at 90%, and we, we need more support. You say, well, what if you don't get it? Well, we'll just do less, but we'll keep doing God to provide, but it'd be a whole lot better if we could go down with 100%. So I'd ask you to pray about that as a partner. Would you pray? Would you ask God what you should do? And would you do what God wants you to do? And then we thank you for being a faithful partner for almost 40 years, 39 years. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, if we can show the presentation, I appreciate it. This is the camp choir singing, by the way. It was taken on a little camera, so the quality is not that great, but it's still uh, a blessing to hear.
Thank you for your faithful support. We know that over the years you've gone through some tough times, and we understand that. We just appreciate your faithfulness. A little bit about Catalan. Catalan's a little city of about 100,000 people. The one church that you saw down in the lower left-hand corner is the one that we just got through turning over. We're going to be starting another church on the opposite side of town, uh, and I'm eager to do it. It just is exciting to me, and we would covet your prayers concerning that ministry. You say, well, Brother Bill, it's mostly camp on the presentation. Well, when you're turning two churches over, you're leading yourself out of it, and we're involved in other things. Actually, when you look at the three ministries, all three of those ministries are full-time ministries. And I just praise God that God has given us the strength to keep up with what we've been able to keep up with, Amen. and God's been very good to us. He's always good. We just kind of notice it every now and then, don't we? Okay, now, let's just have a few minutes for questions. I think we got to have enough time. Uh, don't we, Pastor? We can go to maybe 7.30 or so with the questions. Okay. We've got two rules. Number one, we never have the first question. Nobody likes to ask the first question, so we just eliminate it. Okay? Number two, you can, you got to ask any question you want to. I can answer anything. My favorite answer is, I don't know, but it's an answer, okay? Good. We have our second question right here. Yes. Wonderful. Well, I, actually, not really. It can really get hot down there. Sometimes it gets all the way up to 94 degrees, and it gets really cold. Sometimes it gets all the way down to 55 degrees. It's just awful. When pastors come down to visit us, and we'd encourage you to send your pastor, if you can't find, afford a round-trip ticket, just send a one-way ticket, okay? Uh, but uh, when pastors come down, I just give them one instruction at the end of their visit, and, they, and you say, what's that? I say, don't destroy our image. They say, what do you mean? I say, people back in, back in the States think we're suffering down here. Now, don't you tell them different. It's a wonderful place to live. It really is, and God has been very good to us. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, I did that once. I used to raise bees, and that's about the only way you can get away from is jump in the water. Okay, good. Yes, sir. No, there are not. The largest area that has more Japanese, the largest area outside Japan with Japanese and it's some follow, and that's about 11 hours south of where we live. But we do have some Chinese around that have bought uh, uh, big ranches, but not a whole lot. 
Okay. Good. You have a heart for the Japanese? Well, come on down. Let's go down to Sao Paulo and start winning the Lord. There you go. Huh? Oh, Mitsubishi Motor Company is in Catalan. You work for Honda, is that not right? Uh-huh, okay. My son works for Mitsubishi. I'm so glad he does. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Another question. Yes, ma'am. Our plan when we go back to start this church will be all those things, door to door. I just got a, it's a new accordion for me. Uh, it was actually practically given to me. Uh, my dad bought me an accordion when I was eight years old. He bought it for 300, $350, I can't remember. But back in those days, he made $55 a week. And uh, so I, was, I had another accordion down in Brazil, but I would do a new one. And uh, there was this lady at a church. She had an electric one, and I, I looked at that thing. I must have slobbered all over it. <laughs> I mean, oh, it's a beautiful thing. It did everything but put itself away. But it needed electricity to play it. And I said, well, I don't need that. And she said, you know, where I bought it, he has a lot of used accordions. And would you believe that God provided the money to buy that accordion? And I'm gonna, my plan is to go out and kind of, it's kind of like a city park. And uh, they have open air um, uh, markets on certain days of the week. And if I have to, I'll try to do it without paying anything, but if I have to, I'll rent a little space there, I'll put a stool down there, and we'll play the accordion, hand out tracks, invite people to church. Uh, advertising on the radio, all these things can be used, and we plan to use them. But the best contact is the people contacting their friends, their people, with the gospel and inviting them out. But And I believe that starting out with the uh, I'm so excited about it. If this excitement will transfer to them, they'll get excited about it, and they'll be excited about bringing their friends, and it'll, it'll start that way. But it's a long, hard process to start. But see, we already have 27 years in Catalan. People know us. And I have even a doctor that I've been witnessing to for years. He says, Bill, I don't agree with what you say. I, I, he said, I know you're honest. I, know, I can see that you live what you preach. But he said, it just doesn't make sense to me. But I respect you for what you do. That's the type of testimony we have in town for the glory of God. So that's what, what we plan on doing. Just wearing out shoes. Okay, yes, sir. You had a question? 95% of all Brazilians claim to be Catholic. But they can be Catholic and Masons, Catholic and spiritualists. You can be a Catholic and a drunkard. It doesn't matter. They're still a Catholic. They were baptized that, and that's what they are. Okay? But that's what we... But you know what gives us the worst problems down in Brazil are not the Catholics. Are the Pentecostals. No. Because they preach a certain type of gospel... And people see that it doesn't work. So that when you come and talk to them about the Lord, they say, oh, I already tried that. It doesn't work. It's like being vaccinated against the gospel. And it's really sad. And then we have your community church movement, movement down there. It's kind of, I call them the come as you are, go as you please type church. There's no commitment. And uh, that gives us a little bit of a problem, too, because you can play church without having any type of um, obligation. So it's, that's what we face down there. Other questions? These are good questions. Yes, ma'am. What we eat at home, I love rice and beans. Brazilians eat rice and beans every day. When they get tired of rice and beans, they eat beans and rice. <laughs> uh, it's just every day, beans and rice, meat. And their vegetable might be a tomato and some lettuce or something. That's what they call vegetable. But they do sell a lot of vegetables. What we do when we're home, and we're, we're preaching conferences just a lot of times. A lot of times we have to eat out. 
because we live 20, 20 miles outside of town. But what we do when we eat at home, in the morning, we have a, I guess you call them smoothies in this country. All fresh fruit, mangoes, what, mangoes? yeah, mangoes, we call them mangas. Uh, and uh, papaya and all these things. Susan will take those things. She'll put them in a blender, put a couple of chunks of ice, a little bit of milk, banana, and all those things, and mix it up, and we'll drink that. That's our breakfast. And it's really good. It makes me hungry. Uh, well, I'll get that. Um, then for lunch, Susan makes like small meat, a little bit of meat, not a whole lot. Your teeth get, it's kind of tough meat down there anyway. Uh, but meat, and we'll have mostly vegetables. And then in the evening, we'll generally drink part of, that, part of that smoothie that was left over. In towns, like in our little town of 100,000 people, we have two um, subways. McDonald's won't come in unless you have 150,000 people in a town. Can you imagine that? Here in this country, I see towns of 5,000 people have a McDonald's uh, and everything, but down there, no. Uh, but in a town, a town that's about what, two hours away from us, they have McDonald's, they have Subway, they have a Burger King, and you'll pay as much for that as you will for a full course meal really? at a Brazilian restaurant. Wow. <laughs> Ask me what I'd rather have. That spit of meat, you know, and oh, pass that food was good tonight, but boy, this could make you hungry again. Okay, uh, another question, yes, sir. Is that uh, Portuguese or was that one of the Spanish food or something? All Portuguese. Okay, yeah, I, I was wondering too, are they under martial law? No, we're not. We're under a socialistic government. Okay, uh, they're coming up for elections too, and so you really pray. Really pray. They're all socialists, but you got some socialists that are more conservative than others. Okay, over here there was a question. Yes, sir. How would you live if the water safe to drink? Yes, we have a well that's about 160 feet deep. It gives us um, 1,200 liters an hour. Uh, that's 300 gallons an hour. We have a tank that's 10,000 liters, so it just, whenever it gets down a little bit, the float keeps that tank full. And it's, it's just almost like uh, your, what would you call it here, mineral water. It's really pure. It's good. It's good. Yes, ma'am. We have, uh, not in Catalan, but we have cities in Brazil, they've actually built mosques, and there's a big Islamic population, actually one of the supporters of the camp. And this brings up another thing. What we're trying to do in the camp, we're trying to raise the capital expenses from here, the money to build that, that uh, covered area, capital expenses. But we're also, on the Brazilian side, trying to raise some monthly expenses. We're trying to get churches to take the camp on as a missionary project so that after the camp is completely built they'll have the money that they need to maintain it because you realize if I were to have to do that today the camp completely from scratch it would cost me over two million dollars I've never had two million dollars in my life I don't know how God did it I really don't but the dollar was high labor was cheap and we and we were able to do it. But today, if I had to do it today, it cost me $2 million. So for a Brazilian, one church can't do it. It has to be a group of churches that will maintain it. So we're looking towards the future to see Brazilian support that ministry as they would support a local church. You might say we're church planters and camp planters. It's kind of hard to pronounce camp planters, but it comes together. Okay. Did I answer your question? I talk so much, I don't know if I answer or not. Yes? How easy is it to get Bible study? It's easy, as long as someone wants to pay the freight to get them down there. And we need Bibles. This is another area I'd like to see happen, 
as we're playing like the accordion at a city park or the plaza, I'd like to be able to give Bibles out and invite people to come to church. Just one, Portuguese. That's it. And we... Hmm? We don't have any Islamic people in our area. They all speak Portuguese. Now, where, the, where they're in the major cities, I don't know. There are probably some immigrants that still haven't learned it. But uh, all the people in our area speak Portuguese. Much better than I do. Okay? Thank you, Pastor. Singing together, shall we? Turn to 337, 337, trust and obey. 337. Brother Bob? Let's try 337. That's all right. Trust and obey. There we go. On that first. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory. Abide with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. On that third, not a bird and we pair, not a star. Repay not a grief nor a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Together, then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. Be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. All right. Now, won't go all the way through the prayer sheet or anything tonight, but um, a couple couple things. Uh, Brother Brett is going to be here tomorrow at 1, Thursday at 1, uh, to try to get some things together for the uh, float that we're going to have in the parade. So if you want to give him a hand with that tomorrow, I think it's just sorting some things out and getting, uh, picking up a few things that we might need to get for that. That's 1 o'clock tomorrow, and then 11 a.m. on Friday, he'll actually be getting the things on the trailer, okay, that's going to become our float, all right? Uh, that's uh, getting some banners. We're going to have banners going down both sides. There's going to be bales of hay. There's going to be a, a, a wooden cross and things like that so if you want to help out and you can help out uh, see brother brett or uh, show up 1 p.m tomorrow or 11 on friday okay and then um remember 6 30 tomorrow night 6 30 friday night and then 5 30 saturday for the international dinner uh if you're going to be uh, in the parade and uh, walk along and pass out the john and romans and such on saturday morning then um i think we're going to meet uh, out here we're still grove city's been very slow in coming up with uh definitive <laughs> directions on where we're supposed to be and all that kind of thing we know the southwest boulevard thing but i think we ought to meet here and, and if you're here what's good bob Eight fifteen, or is it eight o'clock or what do you think um, you got any ideas on that because was So 8 o'clock would probably be good. 
well, we can meet here at 8 and then head down from here uh, to the staging area where we need to be. All right? So if you're going to be involved with that on Saturday morning. Okay? And then pray for Richard Straw. Richard is Jan Proke's father. Uh, Richard is 92. Okay, almost 93 years of age and going to have cataract surgery in the morning. And she would appreciate you remembering him in prayer, if you would, um, in Virginia, if I remember right. And uh, so pray for him, if you would, tomorrow morning. All right? Okay. Looking around to see anybody here tonight for the first time. Your first time here. Seen a few second timers. And uh, good to have you here. But uh, nobody for the first time. Okay? Let's sing again together. Take your songbook, will you? Turn over to number 241. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Let's all stand together to sing 241. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Find your seats if you would as we sing that last marvelous infinite massless grace when we get to the chorus i'll have the ladies drop out we'll sing that a cappella on that last together marvelous infinite matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe you that are longing to see singing you may be seated ushers are coming and we'll receive the offering tonight and this will go to the keepers and let's be a blessing to them and give us to be a it's not uh it's never easy to travel and uh i'm sure that they would much rather be in brazil right now and continuing to work than to be back here having to go from church to church to state to state and uh I, i'm sure it's this part I think is enjoyable getting to be in churches that they haven't got to be in for a while and get to see some of their supporting work but it is uh, it's tough to go around and uh, just traveling's hard uh, and, and especially as you get older it doesn't get any easier uh, one thing I miss when I travel is I miss my bed isn't that crazy uh, when you're young you can sleep anywhere anytime any place it doesn't matter uh anywhere anytime any cost sleep anything when you're young but when you get older it's not so easy but uh let's be a blessing to them all right and uh they've been i just admire people that that, that uh, respect people that stay with it for 38 years and faithfully serving the lord and and are going to stay in the saddle they're going to bury their heart on the mission field that's what they're doing just bury my heart on the mission field lord and uh, may god raise up more like them all right, let's be a blessing then tonight, shall we? Father, bless this offering this evening. Thank you for the keepers. Thank you for their heart for you. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing on their lives through these years. And, Lord, uh, not only what you've done, but what you've yet to do, if you tarry your coming through them. And so, God, I pray that you bless this offering tonight. Let us be a blessing to them. Let it be a real encouragement, Lord. We don't know their needs. We've not discussed anything as far as personally. But I pray this will be a great help and a blessing to them tonight. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Get your Bible ready. Brother Kiefer's going to come. He's going to preach for us this evening. And uh, you come, Brother Kiefer. We're ready to listen. Appreciate the opportunity. Before we get into the Bible, I want you to put your hand on your nose. Not in your nose, young people. On your nose, okay? Now, I want everybody to turn your head over towards the organ side of the church. Now, turn it back to the front. Now, turn it back over here to the piano side. Now come back to the front. Do you notice what happened to your nose? Mine started itching. But your nose moves, doesn't it? You know, behind your hand is your personal relationship to Jesus Christ and your personal growth. In front of your hand is your mission field. I didn't go to Brazil to be a missionary. I'm a missionary right here in the United States. Or if I travel to Canada or travel wherever, wherever I go, I'm to be a missionary. And you know what? It's just not me. All of us are to be missionaries. God has put us in certain places where we are to represent him as his missionaries. And if I had a few more days to be here, I'd love to preach about that a little bit. But we'll leave that for another time. But tonight, we're missionaries in Brazil. We've been there 37 years. But you might ask, Bill, why Brazil? I could ask the same question. Why Brazil? I'm a third generation mechanic. My grandfather, my great uncles were mechanics. My dad, my, my dad was a body and fender man and a mechanic. I was a B-52 mechanic. There is no reason in the world to even suspect that I would have the natural capacity to be a missionary. But let me read first the scriptures, and then I'd like to kind of interweave how God led my life to go to Brazil, and how he can lead in your life also, if you obey the principle that we'll discover here in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. Actually, let's start reading and verse 4. Would you stand with me as we read in respect to the Word of God? 1 Corinthians 16, starting in verse 4. And if it be me I, that I go also, they shall go with me. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, that ye may bring me on my way, on my journey, whithersoever I go. For I will not see you by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray tonight that you would open our hearts to it, that you would transform us and guide us. Help us, Lord, to do thy will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Our pastor at Southside Baptist Church, on April 13th, 1975, preach from this passage. And he explains some certain things that really apply to my life. But let me tell you my story so that you'll just kind of know how it applied. I was born in a non-Christian home, a pagan home. I could tell you where to find the pornography. I could tell you where to find the liquor. I could tell you where to find the, the cigarettes and even the matches to light them. I could tell you where to find everything but God. I wouldn't be able to tell you that. I can remember just as a little guy wanting to know God. I went to a United Methodist Church. They didn't preach the gospel, but they told all the stories about God and about Abraham and all these stories. And I said, I want to know God. How can I know God? It wasn't until I was 16 years old that I was invited to a Youth for Christ uh, campus life meeting on the high school campus. That's the first time I really understood how to know God. 
that I must first of all repent of my sins and turn and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as God as my personal Savior and that he would forgive me for my sin, of all my sins and he would save me. That night I went home and I knelt down beside my bed. I never remember praying in my life. I knelt down beside my bed and I said, God, I don't understand all this business about being saved. But I understand that I'm, I'm a sinner. Because I'm a sinner, I have my destination made to go to hell. And I don't like that idea. And I want to have you forgive my sin, come into my heart, and save my soul. I crawled into bed the most disappointed person you could ever imagine in your life. You said, what? You just got saved and you crawled in your bed disappointed? Yeah, I expected lightning to flash or, or feel the warm fuzzies or something to happen. And then I did my second prayer. You know what it was? I said, God, I didn't feel anything, but I did what you told me to do. And I'll count that as my salvation. Was I wrong? Not on your life not on your life. I, later on, I joined the Air Force. It's back during the Vietnam War, and they were drafting everybody and their brother. They, I discovered after I went into the Air Force that they discovered that our draft board was corrupt, that they were getting paid to get us poor guys and leaving the rich guys out. But anyway, I decided I didn't want to go in the Army because I already knew how to shoot a gun. I didn't want to go in the Marines because I already knew how to crawl in the mud. I didn't want to go in the Navy because I get seasick on boats. So I went in the Air Force. I went in the Air Force to get out of California. We're from California. I was born there. I grew up there. I wanted to get out of California. And I joined the Air Force. Would you like to believe where they stationed me after basic and tech school? They did. They stationed me 72 miles where I grew up. And I didn't really understand. I volunteered for Vietnam. I volunteered for every place to get out of California and couldn't do it. And then I met my, the young lady that was to be my wife the third year that I was in the military there. Oh, I went to Guam. I went, uh, you know, I, I worked on airplanes and went over Vietnam and all that. But I always came back to March Air Force Base. I met my wife at the church that she went to when she was back home from uh, Bob Jones University. And uh, I met her. First time I saw her, I thought, I want her. I want her for my wife. Two weeks after we started dating, I told her she was going to be my wife. She didn't believe me. But was I right? Yeah, 45 years now. And God has been good. We got married. We moved back to Greenville, South Carolina for her to finish her last year of school. I had absolutely no plan of doing any kind of education. I wanted to work on airplanes. To this day, I enjoy, I like the smell of JP4 jet fuel. I really do. It just, I love it. We go to the airport, and I, I enjoy just being there, wishing I could work on airplanes. But God had something greater. During those days, I tried to get a job working on airplanes. There were more toolboxes than there were airplanes. Everybody was getting out of the Air Force and the Army and everything else, so there were no jobs. I got a job repossessing furniture. And, you know, that's a real popular job. I made $100 a week, and um, I wasn't very happy. And Dr. Garlock was our Sunday school teacher back in those days. He said, if you're not doing God's will, why not? And if you are doing God's will, why are you griping? I go, whoa. And I, I said, okay, I'll not gripe anymore. I'm glad for this job. The next week, I got offered two jobs. And then I decided to go back to school. I was a physical education major at Bob Jones University. I was probably one of the worst physical education majors they ever had in the history of the university. As a matter of fact, after I graduated a couple of years later, they discontinued the program. I think I, I, think I destroyed it. I don't know. But anyway, God was preparing the way for Brazil all through this. And I'll explain to you why. While I was in the university, I, I squeezed four years into five. And that fourth year, the end of the fourth year, I kept praying, God, what do you want me to do? I'll do anything but go to California. I will not go back there. You know what God called me to do? Nothing. The, the, heaven was his brass. 
And then on April 13, 1975, Pastor Hanford preached from this scripture. For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. He said, God opens up a door. He doesn't open up two or three doors. Say, okay, my son, you choose which one you want to go through. He opens up a door, and you have one choice. Obey or disobey. If you obey, that's fine. If you disobey, you're in sin. I thought, oh, my, I'm in sin. Because I was saying, God, I'll go anywhere but California. I'll not go there. I told Susan, I said, let's go forward. She said, for what? I said, I'll tell you later. We went forward, and I just told Pastor, I said, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything God wants me to do if you'll just show me. And I sent out resumes to schools to teach. Would you like to guess where? California. I was serious. God, you want me there? I'll go there. No problem. But he didn't want me there. Our church during those days was such a missions-minded church like this. And when a missionary would come in, like uh, in Greenville, there were always missionaries coming in and going out because of different missions agencies located in the region. Our church, if it was a missionary, we supported. As many as people that was off, out of school or off work would go to the airport and meet them. There would be a crowd there. And the people would look at everybody there and say, wow, it must be an important person. Coming in. Yeah, it certainly was. One of our missionaries. When he would leave, the same thing. We'd see him off. We knew a missionary, Marvin Frey. He's been on the field for almost 50 years. He asked my wife. His daughter was just little, and she was having some problem with pronunciation. Kids that grow up in two languages often have that. And so he asked my wife, would you mind helping her? And sure. So we went over there, and Marvin Frey, by this time, I was wanting to go to the mission field. But I wanted to go to either England, Australia, or Canada. Why? Speak English. I didn't even know a verb was conjugate. You know, I go, you go, he goes, they go, and all that goes. I didn't have an idea. When they talked about personal articles, I thought that was the, you know, those personal things you put in the underwear drawer. <laughs> I did not know. And I told him, I said, oh, well, they don't speak English down in Brazil. I could never learn another language. He said, would you pray about it? I said, yes, I will. He said, would you like to see our presentation? I said, sure. What for? <laughs> After I saw that presentation, I said, I'm going to Brazil. Well, what about the language? God gave me the gift. Amen. That part of my brain is dead. Okay, I'm brain dead on that side. Languages is not with me. I'm a mechanic. Languages don't have a why. They just have. What do I mean by that? You know, every time the teacher would te say something, I'd say, why is that? And finally, my wife had to say, quit asking why. There is no why. Well, mechanics, there's always a why. You start from one end to the other, you go back and find out what the problem is. I stopped asking why, started memorizing, and God gave me the gift to learn the language. Today, people say, you're not Brazilian, are you? And I said, no, I'm American. Uh, my accents lie, you know, you know me from a long ways. I even look like an American. And they look at me and they say, where did you learn how to speak Portuguese so well? That's God. That's God. So tonight, if you come to me and say, I can never learn a foreign language, you're talking to the wrong guy. I'll tell you what. But going back to the scripture, I'd just like to point out a few things. It will not go long, I guarantee it. It says, for a great door and effectual is open unto me. I'd just like you to notice that it's a great and effectual door. What does that mean, great? Great as to its opportunity. It's a wide door. Down in Brazil, they have a number of sizes of doors. If your living room door or whatever to the outside, they're generally 80 centimeters, centimeters. They can be a little bit bigger, up to a meter, okay? That'd be a little bit less than 39 inches, okay? A bathroom door is 60 to 70. Why is the bathroom door not as wide as the front room door? You don't have to put furniture in there. So it's a cheaper door, so you put a little skinnier door there. It's just the way they do down there. This is a great door. You don't have to go through it sideways, you go through it straight through. It's great. And do we not have a great opportunity today? And it's effectual door. It means that people are out there 
needing the gospel. I read this recently, and I had heard this story before about two people that went to China, I think it was China, to sell shoes. One person went there and said, why, nobody wears shoes, and wrote back. Said, no reason to send shoes here, nobody wears them. And he went back, to, back home. And the other guy that went to China, he says, send all the shoes you can send, nobody has shoes here. <laughs> we got a fantastic mission field just out beyond the point of our nose. We live in a satanic, humanistic society today. And whenever it gets darker, the light grows brighter. You know, I could turn on a flashlight here and they would say, boy, what dinky little flashlight. But if we didn't have any light, that flashlight would be very valuable. We live in a dark age here in this country as well as down in Brazil. It's a great and effectual door. But that door is not going to stay open forever. Five years ago, it'll be five years ago, the 19th of November. I saw that today. I was in a hospital waiting for an operation. On that day, before I operated, Susan had to go out and do some emails. I was in the room by myself. All of a sudden, I couldn't breathe. I, didn't, I couldn't even call the nurse, nothing. I was dying. All of a sudden, the nurse comes through the door, said, you call me? I said, no, I didn't, but I know who did. God called you. And she, they brought me oxygen. To this day, I don't know why I wasn't on oxygen already. But uh, brought me oxygen, obviously, I, I went through the night. They operated on me the next day. But that open and great and effectual door could have been closed that night. But it wasn't. When's your door going to close? I hope it's going to be a long time. People ask me, they say, well, you know, you think you'll live a long time? I say, I'm not looking to die. I'm looking for the uptaker, not the undertaker. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to die. It's a waste of money to buy a coffin. Let's just go up in the rapture. It's a lot better. Amen. Great and effectual, but one day it's going to close. One day the doors to different countries are going to close. Do you realize how important the economy of this country is? The biggest, the largest country in the world sending out missionaries is the United States. What's going to happen if our economy crashes? It's serious. It's serious. We need to work while it's yet day, because the night cometh when no man can work. It's a great door, an effectual door. It's a great door, an effectual door there as it is here. We need to use the opportunity. As we go throughout the country, I always pick up tracks. I never know what address is on the tracks, because it goes so many places. We've already traveled over 17,000 miles uh, during our time here since April. And we have probably another three to five more to go. But anyway, as we travel, I'm always handing out tracks. And generally, now I don't just throw the track on the table like I used to. When the, after about two or three times that I've thanked the waitress for service, she'll come by and say, can I have your water? Oh, thank you so much. And I'll, Journey, I'll take a track out and I say, I'd like you to take this and put it in your pocket. I'd like you to go read it. And do what it says to do. And they generally thank me and put it in their pocket. I don't know if they throw it away right away or not. But that's their problem, not mine. But we need to be busy. We need to reach our neighbors. We need to reach the people who work around us. It's a great and effectual door. And there are many adversaries. Who's our biggest adversary? How many of you think it's the devil? How many of you think it's someone in your family? How many think it's you? I'm my biggest adversary. I am. I am. There are many adversaries, but the door is still open. I would encourage you tonight to reach your mission field for Jesus Christ. I would encourage you tonight. I see there's young people here tonight. We need missionaries down in Brazil. We really do. We need people that come down and help us in the camp. We would like to start a Bible institute. Uh, we need to plant more churches. 
We live in a town of 100,000 people with one fundamental Baptist church in the whole town. And it's only running maybe 50 or 60. We got another 954,000 people to reach. I guess, no, that's not. 900, well, whatever, you do the math, okay? If you can, if you feel like God would want you to do it, just go through the door that God opens to you. And God will bless you. Let's pray. Dearly Father, thank you tonight for this opportunity just to open your word and give a little bit of testimony. Lord, we're not trying to draw attention to ourselves, but we're trying to draw it to you and to your mission, Lord, to your field. We just pray that you'd raise up laborers for the mission field, uh, be it Brazil or be it China or Japan, wherever, that you might open hearts and direct lives. That we might see people saved in foreign countries and people saved here. To your honor and glory, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to go ahead and bow your heads for a minute, if you would, please. And <clears throat> You know, it's a wonderful, great thing about having men and women in who have, we said the other day, surrendered to the call of God, surrendered to the command of God. There was an airplane mechanic who's now been a missionary for 38 years. I wonder if there's somebody here tonight who you had your idea on being what you wanted to be you have your idea this is what I'll do with my life but just maybe tonight maybe you just take the challenge that that missionary posed to him will you just pray about it are you willing to say God I'll go anywhere you want me to go I'll do anything you want me to do as you heard tonight God can take care of any excuses he can take care of those if you're willing to give them to him. I wonder if there's anybody here tonight and say, Preacher, you know what? When he was speaking, God was speaking to my heart. And I, I am going to pray and ask God what he wants me to do with my life. Will you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me tonight? There's one, there's two, three, four, five, six, seven. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. God bless you. You may put them down. Amen. I'm going to have Lisa play. And I want you to go home and pray about it, though I hope you will. But I think you ought to come and kneel to the altar tonight and pray about it. And so I'm just going to have Lisa begin to play. And as she plays an invitation hymn, God has spoken to your heart just come and bow the knee and just tell God that you'll do anything you'll go anywhere he wants you to go just, just open the door open the door and that you'll go through it that's what I'd ask you to, to, to tell God tonight as Lisa plays God has spoken to your heart you respond that's right that's right good Amen. That's right.
Let's stand together, shall we, everyone standing. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you so much for the good message from your word. And Father, just thank you for the servants you sent our way this evening. What, a, what an honor it is that we can have a part in what you're doing there in the land of Brazil through the Kiefers. And God, I do pray that you would send forth laborers into your harvest. Send them help, Lord. Send them someone who can come alongside and say, let's, let's labor with you in what God's doing here. Supply the, the funds they need for the building a camp. Lord, may they continue to, to reach the next generation for Christ there in the land of Brazil. God, thank you for them. Give them safety as they travel on in their uh, deputation trail here. Lord, raise the needed support that they must have for uh, themselves, for the ministry there. And God, I pray you provide that for them and continue to allow them to be a blessing and encouragement as they were to our church this evening. Lord, we love you. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful, really a wonderful beginning to our missions conference. Lord, thank you so much for meeting with us and for the decisions that were made tonight. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Do make us mindful that we are going to the mission field when we walk out the doors. And Father, I pray that we'll be mindful you're with us and we'll tell folks about you as we go. I pray you'll prepare us for what you have for us these next few nights. Lord, be with our other missionaries as they're traveling to the conference tomorrow. Give them safety and bring them to us. And Lord, I pray that you'll give us a a wonderful, wonderful few days together for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Isn't he wonderful? Wonderful. Wonderful. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Let's hear you sing it tonight. Ready? Uh, isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? God bless you. You're dismissed.